a beautiful day Amen. to be in the house of the Lord. It's not to do this, to do this indeed. I'm glad that you're all here this morning. Uh, look around the congregation. I want to uh, welcome Cindy Barnes, who's here with us this morning, sitting with her sister Abigail, and uh, acknowledge right off that uh, the flowers this morning that are uh, adding more beauty, getting more beauty to our sanctuary are those from their mother Neil's funeral service earlier this week. And so we, uh, we join you in, in uh, your sorrow. Do we have any uh, birthdays or anniversaries to acknowledge this morning? Well, I want to say a birthday, but it's not me. One of us has a birthday, but it's not <laughs> you, Betsy. <laughs> When's your birthday, Wayne? Fifth. The fifth of September. That'll be tomorrow, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Reed, the eighth. Reed has one this week on the eighth. Reed, how old do you be? Six. Six? Wow. Wow. Williams is on the six. Where's William? There he is. Awesome. How, hey, William, how old you will be? 20. <laughs> Bridget, can we sing happy birthday? shook at the sound of their shouting, and the house was filled with smoke. 
I said, mourn for me, I'm ruined. I'm a man with unclean lips, and I live among people with unclean lips. Yet I've seen the King, the Lord of heavenly forces. Then one of the winged creatures flew to me, holding a glowing coal that he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt has departed and your sin is removed. Then I heard the Lord's voice saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? I said, I'm here, send me. Right, and I think the opening was 64. Number 64, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, based on the scripture that Katie just read. Yeah. 
Are you feeling the heat? Because I'm starting to feel the heat. I mean, it's starting to get like warm up in here. Can you not feel it? But what's up with that thing? I mean, it's like, that's, that's like a fire burning. It's burning wood, isn't it? That's what it looks like. And I can feel the heat. Shall we go a little closer and see what's happening? Yeah, come on, let's go a little bit closer. Let's go a little closer. You can come around. But, but Blake, when you come close, like right in this space, you have to take off your shoes. You have to take off your shoes to come in this space. Yeah, just slip your shoes off. Can you feel the heat yet? Still not feeling the heat. What is it? How is it that there's a fire up there, but the screen's not burning? It's not a real fire, but it sure looks like a real fire. It's not in the house. It's not in the house. Oh, because I think that's a real fire that we're looking at. But the screen's not burning. You remember the story about Moses? Burning bush. That's right, Robert. Moses in the burning bush. Moses was out being a shepherd one day, which is what Moses did for a living. He shepherded sheep. And he's up on the mountain and he's shepherding the sheep. And all of a sudden he sees something that looks kind of like this. It looks like the bush is burning, but it's not. And he goes closer. And when he gets really close to it, he hears the voice of God. And God says to him, Moses, take your shoes off because you're on holy ground. When we come into this space inside of the, the altar rail, we're, we consider ourselves to be in holy space, on holy ground. That's one of the reasons that we don't sit on the rail. And that's when we come into this space, we pay really close attention to things like the candles and the cross, and today, the bread and the grape juice of communion that we'll receive a little bit later. Because this is part of God's holy space. When Moses saw this burning bush, this bush that was burning, but it wasn't really burning, it just looked like it was burning, God began to speak to him about the things that he wanted Moses to do, the places he wanted him to go, and the people he wanted him to see, and the message that he wanted him to take there. So this morning, and for the next several weeks, that's what we're going to be talking about. What is it that God is calling us out to do? And how is God preparing us and equipping us for it? Okay? And I think that this is a message that will be important to you too. Will you pray with me? Okay. Let's close our eyes and pray to God. Holy God. Holy God. Thank you for bringing us. Thank you for bringing us into this holy place, this holy place where, we can see you, where we can see you and hear you, and hear you like never before. Like never before. In, Jesus name. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I, have, um, I have nothing for you this morning. <laughs> I have gotten spoiled by having Miss Julie do children's time. I got nothing for you. I'm so sorry. There's, color, there's crayons, but I've got no coloring books. <laughs> Woe is me. You know what you're saying, Katie? Woe is me. <laughs> Sorry, guys. You can go back and sit with Mom and Dad, and I'll see you again in the book. Okay? I've gotten very comfortable this summer with not having, uh, having to prepare the children's time and to do those lessons. But I also have noticed, and I had shared this with uh, Julie Dahl a few weeks ago, uh, that I have missed this interaction with the children. And, uh, and so it's good to be back, even if I come back only partially prepared. comes from the book of Exodus, selected verses from chapters 3 and 4, and it follows the story of Moses' encounter with God up on the, on, on, with the burning bush, or the part of the story that we've talked about with the children. It's a continuation of this conversation that Moses is having with God in the burning bush, the presence of the bush. So we begin with chapter 3. This is God speaking. Now the Israelites' cries of injustice have reached me. I've seen just how much the Egyptians have oppressed them. So get going. 
I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But, Moses said to God, who, who am I to go to Pharaoh and to bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God said, I'll be with you. But, Moses said to God, but if, if I now come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they're going to ask me, what's this God's name? What am I supposed to say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. So say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. Then Moses replied, but, but what if they don't believe me or pay attention to me? They might say to me, the Lord didn't appear to you. And the Lord said to Moses, what's that in your hand? Moses replied, it's a shepherd's rod. The Lord said, throw it down on the ground. So Moses did. And when it hit the ground, it turned into a snake. And Moses stepped back from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out and grab the snake by the tail. So Moses did. And it turned back into a rod in his hand. Do this so that they will believe that the Lord, the God of their ancestors, has in fact appeared to you. But, but, Moses said to the Lord, my Lord, I've, I've, I've never been able to speak well. Not yesterday, not the day before, and certainly not now since you and I have been talking. I have a slow mouth and a thick tongue. Then the Lord said to him, who gives people the ability to speak? Who's responsible for making them unable to speak or hard of hearing, sighted or blind? Isn't it I, the Lord? Now go, I'll help you speak, and I'll teach you what you should say. But, Moses said, but Lord, please Lord, just send someone else. And the Lord got angry at Moses and said to him, What about your brother, Aaron, the Levite? He speaks very well, and I will send him with you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Excuses, excuses. I'm not your God. I don't know what to say. What, what if they don't believe me? But, but I'm not good at public speaking. And then finally, please, please just send somebody else. Moses tried just about every excuse he could think of not to go and do what God was calling him to. And in response to each excuse, God assured him, it would be okay. I'll be with you. Here's exactly what you'll say, and here's what's going to happen. God even demonstrated the power and the signs for him. Have you ever heard that expression, God doesn't call the equipped, God equips the call? God doesn't call the equipped. God equips the call. This week as I thought about uh, this, this message in the beginning of this sermon series on being called out, I remembered and thought about neighbors helping neighbors. How every year we send a group of folks or a group of folks get together and we join with people from all over Lunenburg County and sometimes even from beyond. And we gather together at Cambridge Church on a Friday morning. We have breakfast together and then we're sent out to different projects around the county. Now, unless you're a project leader or a team leader, what do you take with you when you go? Maybe a pair of gloves. If you're sent to a project to do yard work, when you show up at the project, all the tools you need are right there for you. The rakes and the, and the uh, shovels and the long uh, hedge trimmers and the weed eaters, all the tools are provided. If you show up to paint somebody's house, the paint, the paint brushes, the rollers, the roller sticks, the rags to clean up your mess, it's all there for you. All the tools are given to you. If you go to put in a, a new handicap ramp, the lumber's already there. 
The screws are there, the bolts are there, the drills, the saws, the levels, the squares, all the tools are provided. That's what God is talking about with Moses. God gave Moses the words to say, and a spokesperson even to say them. God gave Moses the staff and the power. Everything he needed to do the mission that he was being given. Moses, this shepherd from Midian, goes on to speak truth to power, to speak to Pharaoh, to lead the people of Israel out of slavery and bondage and into or to the promised land. Moses stands in the presence of God as mediator for the people. And it's through Moses that God parts the Red Sea, delivers the Ten Commandments, and establishes an entire system of governance for the Israelites. Please, Lord, just send somebody else. Katie opened our service this morning reading the, the call of Isaiah, the prophet, from chapter 6 in Isaiah. Isaiah's communication with God occurred through visions and dreams. That's how God spoke to him. And when Isaiah is called in that passage that we heard this morning, God is calling him to be a prophet to the people. But Isaiah's response is, I am a person of unclean lips, and I come from a people of unclean lips. In other words, he's saying, I'm not worthy. I won't be able to speak words worthy of you, God. In his vision, one of the winged creatures who sits with God at the throne takes a hot coal from the fire and touches it to Isaiah's lips. And he says to him, your guilt has departed. Your sin is removed. In other words, you have been cleansed of your excuse. <coughs> he removed the obstacle. He took away the excuse so that Isaiah could then say, here I am, send me. The prophet Jeremiah, whom we studied and listened to much of the summer, he had an excuse when God called him out. Ah, Lord God, he said, I don't know how to speak because I'm only a child. Yes, a youth. I'm a child. In other words, I'm inexperienced. I've never done this before. I don't know what to do. And God's response to, uh, to Jeremiah was this. He told him, he said, don't say that. Don't say, I'm only a child. Where I send you, you must go. What I tell you, you must say. And then God touched his mouth and said, I'm putting my words in your mouth. For some strange reason, the prophets seem to be notorious for coming up with excuses. Ezekiel, he was bitter and deeply angry that God had chosen him because he was afraid. He was afraid of what other people would say. He was afraid of what others would think about him or what they might even do to him. And then there's Jonah. Jonah ran away rather than do what God wanted, which was to save Jonah's enemy. Jonah's excuse was that he didn't agree with God. He didn't want his enemy to be saved. And so he tried to run away. I think this is one of the greatest challenges to us as Christian disciples. Oftentimes we want to be selective about who we love or forgive or feed or house or clothe. We want to pick and choose those we think are worthy, i.e., remember Isaiah. Those whom we approve of, those whom we agree with. This was a challenge that Jesus constantly faced. And sometimes it was even directed at him. John chapter 4, the story of the woman at the well. Jesus faces her bigotry, her racism, her sexism, her religiousism, if you want to call it that. Who do you think you are? She says to Jesus. You're a Jew and a man, and I'm a Samaritan woman. You've come asking me for water? You shouldn't even be at this well. This is for my people, she says to Jesus. These Old Testament call stories from the time of Moses to the prophets. These are stories about people who are being called out for the first time. 
being called to, to go and do God's work, to do God's mission, to do God's ministry in the world for the very first time. But we're not like them, are we? See, we've been going to church for a long time. We've been serving in the church for years, all of our lives, maybe. We do what God calls us to, and we don't make excuses. We do food pantry and cleaning and school supplies and mission trips and small groups and participate in studies. We teach Sunday school. We participate in Sunday school. We serve as greeters and nursery small committees. We are Jesus followers, disciples who have answered God's call. Somebody say amen. Amen. In the 14th chapter of John's Gospel. Jesus is preparing his closest disciples for his death and departure. What do you mean you're leaving us? They asked Jesus. We don't know what to do. We don't know what to say. We don't know where we're supposed to go. John's too young and inexperienced. Peter's getting too old for this. These are disciples who, like us, have heard the teaching and the stories of Jesus for years. They've been there with Jesus in their lives. They've experienced and seen the power that Jesus can bring to bear and bring healing to people. They know those who were formerly were blind but now can see. They participated in the feedings. And they've been with Jesus in prayer. They watched Jesus walk on water and calm the storm. And friends, we have too, right? They've been successful in their preaching and in spreading the good news and in their healing and in their visiting. When Jesus sent them out as pairs as part of the original 12 and when he sent them a second time as part of a larger group of 72, they experienced success as Jesus' followers and as Jesus' disciples. And yet, what are we going to do? How are we going to manage without you? We're too young. We're too old. We're too inexperienced. We don't know what to do. Jesus tells them in that 14th chapter of John's Gospel the same thing that God said to Moses. Do not be afraid. I will be with you. My Holy Spirit will lead and guide you, telling you what to say and what to do. My Holy Spirit will guide you to whom you are to minister, with whom you are to serve. The Son of God tells us that this morning. It's the message Moses received. It's the message the prophets received. It's the message that Jesus gave to his closest followers. And it's the message that he gives us this morning. I'll be with you. Don't be afraid. Go where I send you. Do what I ask you to do. Trust me. <coughs> Trust me and allow me to lead you. So I promised you, if you've been reading Facebook this week, or if you were here last Sunday, that I was going to give you the excuses, right? The excuses that you could use to throw back at God, or the excuses that you could use when people pressure you or the preacher asks you to serve on another committee or to do another project. I've given them to you this morning, right? I've given you like a dozen possible excuses that you could use to go back at God or come back at me. But I think most of you, like I, most of us have our go-to excuse. We have the one that we like to use. It's the one we go to quickly and probably at this stage in our lives pretty naturally when you're asked to do something that you've not done before, you don't want to do, you're uncomfortable with, you're challenged by. So in each of the, the rows, Barbara's got it here, Julie's got it, Betsy's got it, uh, Jeff's got it in the back, there's a cup. And in the cup is a little strip of paper. We're going to pass those around, send those cups through the sanctuary. Take a piece of paper and use the pencil that's on the pew back in front of you. And I want you to just write down that word or two or that phrase of your excuse. Whatever that go-to excuse is, whatever you use to put up a barrier, to put up an obstacle, say, yeah, I'm not doing this. And here's why. It can be a word or two. And this, my friends, is between you and God this morning.
And I want you to take your little piece of paper and fold it once, twice, three times. I want you to just hold it in your hand now. And let us pray. Holy God, we thank you this morning for calling us out, for inviting us to participate in ministry with you, knowing that you will walk with us and guide us and lead us. And we hand over to you now our excuse, our go-to excuse, the reason that we use to not be obedient, the reason that we use to, to, to divert attention away from what you're calling us to do. We hand it over to you today to clear the air, to get it off our plate and put it back into your hands because we know that you can take care of it for us. Thank you, God, for this opportunity this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hold on to those because when we come to the rail for communion late in the service, I'm going to invite you to bring them and leave them. Let's stand and sing, friends. Here I am, Lord, number 593.
Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, all who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us join together, confessing our sin before God and each other. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the need. Forgive us, we pray. Free us from joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Friends, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory, Glory to God. God. Amen. Please be seated. One of the ways in which we, one of the ways in which we worship God, and one of the ways in which we respond to God's call in our lives is by sharing back to the ministry of Christ Church with the blessings that God has given to us. So I want to invite the ushers to come as we give our tithes and offerings.
honoring your name, and ask that they be put to use to bring your kingdom to reality here and now, in this time and place, and around the world. We pray your blessing upon those who have given. In Christ's name we all. Over the course of the next uh, three or four weeks through the month of September, we'll, we will be working our way through being called out. Next Sunday as we gather, we will uh, we'll celebrate um, the Waverly Mission and how we have, uh, on that mission trip, we set aside a long-standing uh, reason or excuse for not doing roofing jobs. Um, to, got out of the boat and did a couple of roofing jobs. So I'm, I hope that you'll be here next week. Uh, David Arthur has put together a really nice video presentation, and we're going to just celebrate that mission trip. Over, over 40 people participated as part of our team over the course of those two days. Uh, I, unfortunately, am not going to be here because I'll be leaving next Sunday morning to go on a week-long mission to Redbird, Kentucky. And so the following Sunday, I'll be back on next Saturday, Saturday night a week, and so the following Sunday, the third Sunday in the series, the sermon title is called, There's No Time Like Now. Because I ain't got time for this, friends, to be taking a week and going on a mission trip to Kentucky. But God has put it on my heart and has been relentless about it for weeks and weeks. I don't know why. We're going to find out and talk about it in two weeks. And then the final Sunday in this series of being called out, we're going to talk about what it means to just live lives day in and day out as disciples of Jesus. What does it really mean to be called by God to work in the jobs that you work and to live the lives that you live with family and friends in this community? Uh, and that's where we'll end up at the end of September. So I'm really excited about this month. Uh, I hope you'll invite your friends to come uh, throughout the series and certainly you know, know that next Sunday there will probably be a lot of people here uh, and be prepared for that. Bring welcoming uh, our guests and friends that are part of our mission trip and their families. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks for this day and this opportunity to come to this special and sacred place, this holy ground to worship you. We thank you for the beauty of this day and the joy of creation that, uh, that we experienced on this morning as we arose and listened to the birds and felt the cool morning breeze. We give you thanks for that. We give you thanks for the opportunities that we have in this community and in our lives not just to worship you, but to serve you. And we thank you for calling us out, calling us outside the building to care for our neighbors and to love them like you loved us. Lord, we lift up to you this morning our church and pray for its continued renewal. We pray for our community that you will continue to use us as your instruments to bring renewal and revitalization of spirit and ground. We pray, O oh Holy God, for the United Methodist Church. And we pray for Bishop Lewis as she takes the helm here in Virginia and begins to lead us into the future. We pray your spirit will be upon her, that you will give her the strength and the courage, much like we've heard this morning. For we know that if we are attentive to you and listen to you, that you will guide us and lead us and direct us, for you are always with us. We pray that presence of yours with us this morning, O oh God, for those who we, we love and, and cherish and who are on our hearts and minds. We pray for those who are angry with the world and those who are feeling rejected. We pray for those whose hearts ache this morning with grief and loneliness, whose minds are struggling with depression. We pray for those whose bodies don't work the way they used to. And we pray for the young ones who are just learning to to the, the full extent of what their bodies might be capable of. Lord, have mercy. And we pray this morning, O oh God, for those we lift up to you. Lois Raven, Kristen Linkler, Hurley May Wilkins, Frank Height, Vernon and Virginia G, Karen and Dick Griffith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For Jace, Smiley, Carson McCall, Emerald and Ray. For Connie Puckett and Dorothy Driscoll. For Ashton Hawthorne and family, for May Overly and Dana Bacon, for Shell and Chris Taylor, the Barnes family, for Wendy Rickberger and Margaret Smith and her sister Jean, for Thelma Fallon, for Jean Keeling, for Margaret Wilkerson, the family of Harvey Jeter, 
Hear our prayers this morning, O God, for those that are unspoken. We pray and lift up to you our friend Audrey Smith, Renee Nash, Katie and JT, Caroline West and Ashby Murray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, on this holiday weekend, this Labor Day weekend, we pray for our nation. We pray for those along the east and Gulf Coast who have suffered this week because of the storms, your natural cleansing of your creation. We pray for our nation in this time of, uh, of political activity and discourse, and we pray for wisdom and guidance. We pray for self-control. We pray for candor and honesty. We pray for leadership. We pray for the working people of our nation. And we pray that this weekend they will find some rest. And that they too will know that you are with them in everything that they do. It's in Jesus' holy name that we offer this prayer. And all God's people say. Amen. Friends, our gift of our prayer of thanksgiving to God will continue on page 13 in our hymn. of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ and one with each other, one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, God Almighty, now and forever. Amen. Amen. 
Friends, let us boldly pray the prayers of our Lord Jesus towards the Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Share in the one cup, united as the body of Christ, until he comes again. Katie, can you come? Friends, we have today um, homemade bread and um, well, just grape juice. That's what we'll be serving. And, um, this table does not belong to any of United Methodist Church or the United Methodist Church. All those who love God and want to love God more deeply are invited and welcome. I invite you today as you come and will come to the rail and kneel. Uh, come uh, with that sense of, um, of thanksgiving. Come asking and expecting God to pour out God's grace for you in the gift of bread and wine, bread and juice. And come bringing your excuse to bring to the altar and leave and hand over to God. You'll all come. If you're not able to come to the table, Katie and I will come to you uh, after everyone else is served. Betsy Wayne, why don't you guys start and uh, Gail?
Gracious God, we thank you for the opportunity to come to this table, to come loved and forgiven, and to receive your grace of empowerment, equipping us for the task of ministry. We give you thanks, Almighty God, for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we offer this prayer. Amen. Amen. Friends, let's stand and sing. Number 591, Rescue the Parish.